Hi and welcome to History Makers TV. I'm Matt Prater. Today we've got Ian Watto Watson from Shed Happens and one of his mates, John Anderson, joining us on the program. Welcome to the show, guys. How are you going? Uh, good to be here, Matt. Good to be here. <laughs> good to have Very you on. well, Matt. Thanks for having us. Now, John, you're connected to these uh, Shed Happens nights that Watto's been running. Tell us a bit of your story. Where are you at at the moment, mate? Well, this year in April, uh, my position was made uh, redundant after 28 years with a, a national company. So I've been able to actually pull back and just relax. I don't have anything that's, that's pushing me. Beforehand, I was a um, uh, people pleaser and uh, I, I strived for acceptance in a lot of areas. Mm -hmm. But at the moment, it's, uh, it's a bit rough. Mm. I'm not sure what, what my future is, but I've got a good bunch of mates around me. And Ian's one of those blokes. We'll get to that bit when he said it's a bit rough a little bit further, but John, I reckon you could give the viewers a little snapshot of who John Anderson uh, was as a little boy and a quick run up into your manhood. Um, I was the only boy, uh, an elder sister and a younger sister, and I didn't really have a relationship with Dad. He was... Um, he. I think he struggled with depression because later on in life he uh, committed suicide, but that was after mum and dad divorced. Um, during high school, I, I went to a new school. I, I found it hard to, to fit in with, with a lot of people, but um, you know, I was lonely and uh, I didn't have men in my life. How'd you get on with your dad, in one word? Actually, I was terrified. Mm. Okay, so let's roll it on a little bit further. You uh, get into your teenage years and you get to meet a woman and you want to uh, make a life with her. Uh, so how did you see going into marriage? Well, teenage years I uh, uh, developed, but I actually found Dad's porn collection when I was grade eight, I think it was, and that actually hijacked me. So my view of women was... was was uh, uh, skewed and, and uh, I'm ashamed to say that uh, my attitude towards sex uh, wasn't good and I, I uh, uh, struggled and, and yet I loved I loved women yeah and and the and the woman who you wanted to spend your life with you truly believed that you are uh, gonna love her for the rest of your life I did and we didn't commit I, I was afraid of commitment um, so, uh, what do you mean didn't commit? You didn't uh, actually go. No, we get didn't. Married. We didn't get married. Uh, we were in a de facto relationship for about 11, 12 years. Ah, okay. So, were you uh, reluctant to do that because your mum and dad got divorced, or you didn't see any good examples of why you should be married? I, th I think, looking back, I made two critical decisions. One was that uh, if that's marriage, you can stick it. And if that's religion, you can stick that too. So I walked away and tried to bring myself up and uh, made some pretty horrendous choices. So um, you're a father? Yeah. Tell the viewers about um, your children. I have... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I have two beautiful daughters. Uh, one's just turned 17. And uh, the youngest is 15. But uh, um, I, after we split, that was about eight, nine years ago. So that's how I met you. So, uh, uh, yeah, when you said split, you were thinking you're a pretty cool average bloke. Uh, what were the circumstances? Where were you when you, you, you got the call? Uh, I, was, I was actually uh, at Phillip Island uh, Motorcycle Racetrack for the, the Grand Prix. And I got a phone call. I'd left to waves and goodbyes, and I uh, thought everything was okay. Uh, we were struggling. Um, I was struggling with with work and, and uh, finances and, and trying to keep everything together. Um, I got the phone call saying the relationship was ov over, and um, I actually hot-footed it back to to Brisbane uh, to uh, a locked-out, disastrous situation. Okay, so you made your choices and took your chances. Yep. Marriage didn't mean a thing to you. What about God at this stage of your life? Oh, 
look, God wasn't part of my life at that stage. I, I believed, as a kid, I believed in the Tooth Fairy, I believed in the Easter Bunny, I believed in Jesus, I believed in God, but I didn't follow any, any, of, any of his teachings. But did, when was your first spiritual moment in your whole being in life? <laughs> I think the first time was when I met you at the truck yard. Uh, you uh, invited me to come to a, a shed night. And uh, what did you think a shed night was going to be at the truck yard? Well, through my construction, uh, um, uh, part of my, my work and, and, and sporting uh, teams, I thought I was coming out of depression and I thought it was time to re-engage with uh, society. And you, you said come to, a truck, uh, come to a shed night and I assumed in my head that um, with blokes it would be beer and pizza, topless waitresses, strippers, and I could just <coughs> sit at the back. And, and, and engage, but you know, when I turned up, there was no beer, there was no pizzas, there was no strippers. But what was there? What was the real guts of on the first night you turned up? What really happened? I actually heard three blokes being interviewed, and I heard a bit of your story, a bit of your story, a bit of your story, and I thought, I'm not the only one. Uh -huh. I'm not the only one feeling the way that I did, mm -hmm. and. Uh, I, I was I was gobsmacked. So where's your Bible, that worn out Bible that you got from <laughs> overuse? Well, it, when, when did you start opening on that? Uh, see, this one, we, when I was a kid, we didn't read, but uh, didn't read the Bible. But um, uh, it was a, a gentleman that was interviewed that night. He actually came uh, and picked me up to take me to home group. And uh, it was it was then that we actually I was reparented by, by about eight different older people. Okay, so what, uh, over the nine years of journey of now life, with that painful past of relationship breakup, you got yourself uh, this well-worn testament and you didn't bring the, the big no, version I didn't bring of it. The big it's one. pretty well used. Uh, so where are you with God right now? I actually like who I am. I feel as though I'm accepted and I am loved. It, it, it's been oh, a struggle know, to accept that, but I am loved. You mean like God with Jesus on his knees saying, you are my boy and I'm well pleased with you. Are you yeah. at that place? I'm, I'm getting there. I, I, I waver. Ah, let's get on to that next place. This de thing called depression. Yeah. Talk a little bit about that. Uh, I listen to too many things. I was a typical Anderson male. I was uh, uh, just like my father. I was a no-hoper. And, you know, I you was You believed the lie. I, I, I well and truly believed the lie. And I thought there was no future for me. And if Dad had uh, committed suicide, at what stage do I have to get to before I, I end up being like him? When did you first hear that promise of God, Jeremiah twenty nine eleven. when did you hear that and get it into you? It was when a, a mate of ours, um, Nahum Kozak, actually uh, uh, recited it and uh, you got him to read it over again. And well, I think a lot of men, we've never heard of it and we needed to get it a board that has got a purpose and a plan for us and not to stuff us up, but to actually give us a hope and a future. Yeah. And did you take that aboard? It was. I, I realised when, when, when I would come into these areas of I'm hopeless, I thought, no, I'm not. I have a hope. I've got a future. And as much as I found life hard, I, I could actually rely on those little promises. And, and it was through, through men that actually started encouraging me. And you were one of the, the critical ones. Don't go anywhere. There's another amazing guest coming up soon on History Makers TV. Okay, so again, we're, we're all about the men and the knowledge and trying to sort it all out. <laughs> When's the moment for a man like you who had a, had a really stuffed up view of what love was and you thought you were doing it well, when did you get some glimpses of true love, lovers of God, to think, well, I got that um, relationship wrong with that woman do I ever get a chance to love someone the way God would want us to love as a man loving a woman? It's actually been hearing people like yourself talk about your wife, Margaret, um, other, other couples, 
seeing how the men have treated their wives and how they speak about them. And I thought, I didn't hear that when I was a kid. I didn't see it. And as a boy, I think we learn so much by looking at men. It's not what, what's said or what we read. It's actually watching and we copy and we mimic. Okay, let's jump back to your two daughters. They're at a precious age, 17 and, and 15. 15. Soon to be 15 next okay. week. What can you now do as a father that has uh, shared time with them to give them the best opportunity to go into the future, not uh, having the relationship failure that you had, to give them a hope and a future that marriage is worthwhile? Sadly, with my eldest daughter, she's chosen not to, to have a relationship with me at the moment. But my youngest one, I tell her she's beautiful. I tell her that I love her, that I'm proud of her. And I try to spend as much time as I can with her uh, under the confines of, of you know, the legalities. But you know, just to tell her that I'm, I'm proud of her, that I love her. And the one who makes the choice not to be with you at the moment, what do you actually do for her? Do you, do you, how do you talk to God about her? Oh, there's, there's times I don't know what to say. And uh, I know God hears the groanings in my spirit. But there's times I think, well, Lord, she's your daughter. I have to trust you with her. Mm, and trust has been one of the biggest problems that I've had. And Trusting that because I'm not in control, that he's in control. And you're growing in trust. God's teaching you to grow in trust. Yeah. How, do you see a hope and a future for you to actually love again and be loved by a woman? Yeah. God's way? I do. I, I realise that I actually have to pull back and actually be the real me, not be who anybody else wants me to be. And we'll, we're rolling it up now, but we want the viewers to hear this... Uh, a little bit about depression, how you choose to get through the depression and what guidance you've been given with that. In a world that's sad, sick at the moment, that almost accept that depression, oh, well, where you can go and top yourself or something like that. Where are you now with uh, what's been told to you? A uh, couple of really good mates took me to uh, the doctor and to uh, a psychiatrist, uh, the last uh, bout that I had. And the psychiatrist said he could prescribe to me any drug that I wanted, but the best thing I had was people around me. And it was at that stage that I had to realise that, hang on, I was addicted to my emotions and uh, I was, was going down the track and I had to actually make a choice. I had to claim back my life and, and give it to, to Christ. Um, and it's by his stripes that we're healed. So I actually had to actually make some decisions and actually take responsibility. But I had good people around me and they loved me and they, they supported me. So would it be like putting a, putting a uh, push in the pause button and you don't lose it? You actually get closer to God through this and you... Uh, savour the people around you, don't suck to them, you actually become stronger in who you are and you claim the promises of God through this. Yeah, I've, yeah. I've actually had to become honest. You know, I was lying to myself. Uh, just expand that a little bit. That I had to become honest. What, what's that really mean for a man? I actually had to bear my soul and open up mm. and... Uh, I didn't like the stuff that was in me, mm. but those were lies. Yeah. And yet I actually had to accept that I am lovable. I am accepted by, by men. Um, and, and the blokes that actually, they didn't, they didn't tell me what to do. They didn't beat me into submission. They actually got beside me and they've actually walked with me. And finally, the spiritual part of who you are is, you know, for, for so many of us men, we think we have to solve the problems and that doesn't go much from our head. But the spiritual part of who you are, John Anderson, in your soul and spirit and heart, what's that mean to you now? I, I actually like myself now. I actually 
enjoy my company, but I actually enjoy being with other people without expectations, and I can actually sit and, and be. But I, I actually like who I am. And John Anderson, what's your hope and uh, future for the men of Australia? Look, that they'd become honest and actually stand up and actually realise who they were created to be mm. and that there is a future. Matt, I reckon that on History Makers today, we could say, John Anderson, you are a champion. Absolutely, mate. What an incredible story. And uh, to hear you, blo you two blokes talking here, I'm thinking every bloke in Australia needs to hear what you two have been chatting about today. Uh, I reckon you're a History Maker. Thanks for joining us, mate. Thanks, Matt. Good on, John. You're on History Makers TV. We'll Thanks, have more mate. coming up soon.